Hello and welcome to another installment of Conservation Conversations with BirdLife South Africa. I'm your host, Melissa Howes Whitecross, and I'd like to welcome all of our viewers tuning in through Zoom and Facebook Live tonight. You can communicate with us through the chat room and ask your questions for the speakers throughout the webinar using the Q&A box if you are tuning in through Zoom. Our speakers will answer these at the end of the webinar. And if you're tuning in through Facebook Live, you can send us your questions and comments using the comment feed on Facebook. Some great and exciting news. Our podcasts have gone live and we'll be um, uploading episodes from previous conservation conversations onto this audio platform as we go over the next few weeks. So any of you taking road trips in the upcoming months, be sure to download those audio files and take them with you and have a listen to some of the previous episodes if you happen to miss them. A big thank you to Carl Beerman for his hard work on this. And if you'd like to find the podcasts, you can just click the link on our Conservation Conversations website. Don't forget to use the hashtag Conservation Conversations if you'd like to engage with us on social media. And if you missed out on any of the previous webinars, you can also watch these webinars through the BirdLife South Africa YouTube channel. If you're enjoying these webinars and the work being carried out by BirdLife South Africa, you can support us by donating through the Cricket Donations platform. Simply scan the QR code on your screen or visit the Conservation Conversations website to find the donations link. Thank you to everyone who's donated so far. Your contributions are helping us to keep these webinars free for all to learn and enjoy. Now, many of you will have enjoyed Ernst Retief's webinar in June, highlighting the incredible resource that is the Southern African Bird Atlas Project, one of the most important citizen science projects in our country, undoubtedly. SABEP2 has unfortunately lost its funding in the wake of the COVID-19 crisis. So if you'd like to find out more about the ways that you can assist, please visit BirdLife South Africa's website. A crowdfunding platform has been set up for donations, and I hope that together we can keep this important project going which helps us monitor the changes and presence in our beautiful birds. After this webinar, we're going to be announcing the winner of this month's Jakarta Media Monthly Giveaway Competition. So good luck to everyone listening who did manage to register for this competition. Keep your fingers crossed and we'll let you know who that lucky winner is at the end of tonight's webinar. A big congratulations to Anne Todd, who is the winner of the Zeiss Optics South Africa Hamper Giveaway. We'll be getting in touch with you this week, Anne, to organize delivery of your prize. All Anne had to do was to tune in last week to the third month or the third webinar of each month. We'll be handing out a Zeiss hamper to one lucky listener on that third webinar each month. So thank you to Zeiss for spoiling our Conservation Conversations family. And be sure to tune in to the third webinar each month to stand a chance to win that Zeiss hamper. She's going to be walking away with some exciting hygiene products to help her family stay safe during these crazy COVID times. As some of you may have seen earlier, the registrations for the first ever virtual African bird fair are now open. You can visit the BirdLife South Africa website to find all of the information on the top speakers and exhibitors from across the continent and the globe. And be sure to diarize 5 September and join us at the virtual African bird fair. I did post the link into the chat box on both Facebook and Zoom. So if you'd like to register for that, you can just follow the link in those two um, sections. Now tonight, I am extremely excited to welcome one of my birding idols, a man who needs no introduction, Dr. Warwick Tarbiton, author of many of South Africa's top field guides for birds, including the recently released Cecil 5 and Jakarta Media's Nests and Eggs of the Birds of Southern Africa. Warwick's expertise extend beyond just birds with, fantastic field, uh, with a fantastic field guide co-authored with his wonderful wife, Michelle, who's also tuning in tonight on the dragonflies and damselflies of Southern Africa. Warwick started the Nails Flare Woodland Bird Census over 20 years ago, and this annual weekend event has proved to be a thoroughly enjoyable affair for all involved over the years, myself included. I must give a special shout out as well to Marion Dunkelt and the Friends of Nails Flare, as well as the Bits Bird Club, who supported the event for a number of year, years. Warwick, is an, it's an absolute privilege to have you on Conservation Conversations tonight. I carried out my PhD research at Nails Flare Nature Reserve, and I know that this is a place that is very special to many people. And one of those people is my colleague, Fanny Duplessis. Fanny is the Head of Finance and Operations at BirdLife South Africa. But don't let this chartered accountant fool you. Fanny has an incredible passion for nature, and a keen mind for data analysis, and is also an extremely talented and dedicated birder. 
Fani is currently developing a useful avian ecological index, which will help establish the health of ecosystems using bird presence as a proxy. Fani has participated in the Nails Flare Woodland Bird Census for a number of years and is a dedicated citizen scientist. Warwick and Fani, I am really excited to hear what you have to share with us tonight, and I'm sure our viewers are looking forward to this too. I'm going to hand over to Warwick to share his screen with all of us, and I hope everyone enjoys tonight's conservation conversation. Thanks, Warwick and Fani. Well, good evening, everybody. And thank you for joining this webinar tonight. And this is the biggest audience by far that I've ever spoken to. Um, and thanks, Melissa and Fani, for, for setting this up and for your inspiration in this, because as you both know, my media skills are pretty, very limited. Now, Nailsla is a very special area for me, as it is for you, Melissa. I first came here as a schoolboy. Um, there was a, a bird club camp by the Witz, Witz Bird Club um, when I was 13, and I, I um, went to that. It was the farm called Mosdin, which is just downstream from Nailsla. And right there and then I decided, well, when I'm big, this is where I want to live. I took a, a while to sort of reach that, but eventually it did. And um, I've lived here and worked here for the last 40 years. And I've been directly or indirectly involved in that for all this time. So um, in that time, I've, I've witnessed this system in its extremes from severe drought to these massive periods when we have floods that pull the whole floodplain. So tonight, I want to introduce you to the, the, the woodland bird census, but before that, I'd like to um, talk a little bit about the, the male and the floodplain in the system. So I'll give some general results on the woodland um, and tell you about how we went about it, and then finally we'll follow that up here and extend the analysis and then uh, talk a little bit about the future. Now, the map that you see here in front of you, um, Shows Nail Slay, this green area sort of in the center of the screen. The red road going up the, from north to south, here's the Great North Road, the N1. And there are two points where roads peel off, one to Modi Moli, Nailstrom, which is where Fani grew up, and the other one to Mohopong, which is Nalbom Sprague. So you can see Nail Slay lies more or less between these two towns. Now, Nail Slay, on the left is bordered by the Waterberg hills and mountains, and on the right it's, it's bordered on by a completely different flat landscape, which is the Springbok Flats. And then on top of that, it sits astride the floodplain of the Nile River, which is this dark green wobbly area that you see going through here. It starts down here, more or less where you cross the motorway, or the motorway crosses it, and it's 70 kilometers long before it then becomes a conventional river there, the Mokolokwen, which goes into the Limpopo. Um, and now also is a little gem of a reserve because it has Waterberg, it has the Springbok Flats, and of course it has the floodplain. So with this diversity of habitats that it's got, um, it's not surprising that it's got a terrific bird fauna as well. I think the bird list is now nearly 400 species. And on a summer's day on Nails Play, December, January, you can comfortably see 200 species of birds just in this reserve. So it's something quite exceptional for a, a small area like this. Now, coming closer to the ground, um, this is a view across Nails Play from downstream looking upstream. And this green snake that winds through here is the floodplain. At Nail Slay, it's only about half a kilometer wide, but as you go downstream, it widens until it becomes about seven kilometers wide. And when the water comes down, which it comes down out of the hills of the Waterberg, it floods um, to different degrees in different years. In most years, some water will come down. Um, one year and three, no water comes down. But in those occasional spectacular years, every decade or 15 years maybe, the entire floodplain fills up, and that's an area of 16,000 hectares. So it's one of the largest floodplain systems in South Africa. So it's a very um, important feature from that point of view. Here where it goes through now, so you see on the left and the right woodland, which is acacia woodland, 
that's on these alluvial soils that are associated with the floodplain. And they were woodlands, part of the woodlands that we um, uh, did our work in. Uh, the next picture shows a little bit further downstream, um, nail flow on the right and going downstream on the left where it widens out. And you see it's this broad swath of, of green grass, brown grass, and it's not flooded. But the flood plain is, remains this grassy area simply because of the water. If you took away all the flood water, it would be a matter of decades and this woodland on the other side would encroach over and it would become a woodland. Out there in the far distance on the Springbok Flats, all those open areas are open simply because they are agricultural areas. Now the floodplain, as I've mentioned, is a pretty erratic event, but if you can get there when it's a high flood, you'll be in for something pretty spectacular. Um, the, the next pictures, two of them, taken across male splay in a dry year, the end of a dry summer and in a dry winter, where all you can see is this um, channel and there's no surface water anywhere down the floodplain. And of course, there are no water birds. There's not even an Egyptian goose, not even a blacksmith flatwing. Um, so these dry years, you don't see any water birds, whatever. Come the wet years when the water comes down, and this is a year, a particular year I'm showing here where it was one of those years when the entire floodplain filled up, it becomes this sea of green grass. Now, that green area that you see out there is about a meter deep in water. It's uh, dominated by one particular grass, the rice grass, Ariza staminata, which is a great attraction for ducks. And the, the channel here, which is deeper, that's two or three meters deep, four meters in places, is where you have reed beds. And these reed beds provide the breeding sites for a spectacular array of herons. Um, 16 species of herons and egrets have been recorded breeding on the floodplain. And among them are the biggest populations that we have in South Africa of, of great egrets, 120 pairs, squawker herons, something like 200 pairs, purple herons, little egrets, um, cattle egrets, of course, uh, night herons. And in some years, we've even had these tropical visitors. We've had rufous bellied herons breeding here, sometimes in the reed beds here, but at other times they go out into flooded trees like that and, and breed there. And in one spectacular year, 1996, um, we had slaty egrets breeding here with the other herons and so on as well. So in those areas, it's quite a, a, a spectacle. Now those grassy areas, um, the birds are much less visible, but they are literally full of crakes and rails and gallinules and moorhens. And in one year, I, I've set out a, a plot out there somewhere, and I went through on my hands and knees virtually looking for all the nests. And on the basis of that, um, extrapolating the density I found there, I found, a st I estimated that there were no less than 8,000 breeding pairs of lesser moorhens across the floodplain. And that's a bird you virtually don't see, but if you come in, into the, onto the floodplain at dawn and dusk, you hear them calling by their hundreds up and down the area. So that's the sort of water bird fauna that you have here. And I'm mentioning it now because when we talk about the woodland birds, you will see what a stark contrast it is between the water bird community and the woodland bird community. And then it all dries up and all those birds go away. Now, um, the floodplain was once a stronghold for this bird, the Eurasian bitten, now an extremely rare bird in South Africa. But in the early years when I went there as a, as a youngster, um, remember I was there in a flood year, the sound of bitten's booming was one of the features of the floodplain. You could hear it from where we camped about three or four kilometers away from the water. You could hear these birds booming at night. And this picture here I took in, in 1980 on a nest. It's got a young chick underneath it. Um, and that was just downstream from Nails Flay on the farm of Pultelfontein. And they've sadly gone. I mean, in the last ones were recorded in the early 1990s. So for the past 25 years, 
there have been no more records of Britons in the system. Well, coming to the woodlands, the woodlands have been the subject of much research over the years, um, especially in the 70s and 80s when a, a big program, it was called the Savannah Biome um, Project, was run on male slaters funded by the Department of Agriculture. Its aim was to see, um, sort of gain an understanding on how um, the savannas worked. And um, in those years, students from many universities in South Africa and over overseas universities came in and did PhDs and doctorates. I was one of them. And in that time, more than 100 PhDs and MSCs were produced on the work that came out of Nowsway. So at the time it became a sort of world known um, site for savannah research. This is Bob Scholes on the right, who's well known for his climate change work. Bob was the coordinator of this project in the latter years and he co-authored a book with Brian Walker, which summarized all this work that was done on the savannah. And this book is still available and it's the reference book to tell you what is known about savannas based on on the um, on this uh, work that was done. Um, lastly, I'd like to talk briefly about the Friends of Nail Slave because this woodland um, birds census that we did was is was and is a project of the Friends of Nail Slave. Well, the Friends of Nail Slave was was started 29 years ago by Marion Mengel. This is Marion on the right here. And she has been the driving force of Friends of Nails Bay ever since, doing a tremendous job to put Nails Bay in the public eye. And Nails Bay, unlike many other provincial reserves that have really declined and shut their gates, Nails Bay has remained a functional reserve. It's got um, visitor facilities. You can stay there overnight. You can camp there. And it's a lovely place to go and visit. Our friends of Nail Slave um, not only have put it in the public eye, but they provide logistical and material support for Nail Slave. They buy tractor parts for the tractor, they buy boots and protective clothing for the staff, they clear alien ve vegetation. And every year, Marion organizes a number of, of natural history courses to be held there. Um, this on the left is one of the Friends of Nail Slave newsletters, and they tank stand that you see there in the picture. Um, Friends of Nails, they provided the money to buy the razor wire to protect that particular tank stand from baboons that are coming in there. So um, Nails, they has done and continues to do sterling work in, in that reserve. Um, Now, there are many citizen scientist projects that have um, been involved over the years. I mean, in America, there's the Christmas bird count, which perhaps goes back a century. And here in South Africa, we have um, the ongoing water bird counts, they're called the quack counts. And Nelsle is part of that, it's counted twice a year. We have road counts and we have many species censuses, for example, um, censuses of vultures and ground hornbills and oyster catchers and so on. And the question here was, how do the dynamics of water bird communities compare with wetland communities? And Marion and I hatched the plan, well, let's find out. Let's start fences in water birds and seeing, seeing um, what we get out of it. And we know things change. For example, the disappearance of eagles, not only on Nailsway, but in this wider area. Um, in the 1940s, the previous owner of, of Nails Bay, George Whitehouse, told me that um, there was never a day when you didn't see a battalier overhead. And he showed me the particular tree where they used to nest long ago on Nails Bay. Well, they disappeared by the 1950s. In the 1960s and 70s, a pair of martial eagles nested, nested in Nails Bay. They disappeared, as did a pair of tawny eagles that nested nearby. But even the sort of mini birds like Tinkling, Sisticola, when I 
started my work on nails in the 70s, thinking cysticulars were common in the Berkia woodland. I had mapped the territories of six pairs there. Well, now you're hard pushed to see a tinkling cysticular. And our censuses over these months, over these years, have, have really shown that it's become a very infrequent bird there. By contrast, the red billed oxpecker, which before we started our census, there were no red, red billed oxpeckers on there. Elsewhere, and there were none in the, in the district as far as I know. But when we started the census in the early years, they started creeping in until now. We always have oxpeckers in our accounts, up to 20 birds. So what we were faced with is how do we measure and how do we monitor this change? Do we do transects or do we do point counting? Well, we decided on transects. What time of the year? We decided obviously in summer and we decided to make it the, the um, last weekend of January. December would have been better actually, but December is very busy for visitors to Nails Bay and also a lot of people go on leave at that time and so on. So we might not have had as many recruits to come and count what time of the day. Obviously early morning is the best, which species to include, and which areas to include. And from that we, dis we aim to develop a method where we control the variables to an absolute minimum so that when we did this year's count, we could confidently compare the results with, with last year's count. Now, there are three distinct woodland types on Nails Flay um, along the, the floodplain of us, as I've shown, those, those um, alluvial soils carry acacia woodland. We, we call it acacia, although those names have changed to Richelia and Senegalia. And then in the southern side of the reserve, in the sandy soils on the Waterberg Formation, we have woodland dominated by Berkia Africana. So we call that the Berkia woodland. And then in the north of the reserve, on the shallow sandy, uh, stony soils, we have woodlands dominated by various combretum. So that's our combretum woodland. And you can see in the photos here, they're structurally quite, quite different. Um, this map shows where they are on, on now, so you see up there in the, in the north, the blue area is the Combretum, in the south, the green area is the Berkia, and the um, brown area following the flood plain is the Acacia. And if you look closely, you can see little white traces all over there. Those are, are roads and tracks and trails on Nails Bay, and those are the, the uh, transect routes that we use every year. We've, give, we've given them numbers. This one, for example, is B1, B2, B3, B4, and so on. And it's those routes that we, we stick to every year. So this is how we go about it. The same 18 routes we try and use every year. Six routes per woodland type. And we allocate a team to each of these routes. And that team, usually three or four people, is briefed beforehand on where they go and what they do, how they go about it. And they are asked to be at the start of their route at six o'clock. We try and startle each route so that they're walking away from the sun and they to finish exactly two years, like two hours later. And they record the starting and finishing times in the field sheet provided. And the teams are asked to walk slowly, to pause at intervals, to watch and to listen for birds. And every single individual bird that they see or that they hear is then recorded and counted and taken care not to count the same individual time twice. For example, if they're walking and they hear a Cape Turtle Dove calling on the right, and then a little while later they hear another Cape Turtle Dove calling on the right, unless they shoot another bird, they, they, they don't count it twice. And then all the birds that aren't wetland dependent species are counted, and this includes incidental things flying over. And it includes all the area of foraging birds like swifts and swans and bee eaters. Now the results that come in at the end of the two-hour shift, these are some of is from the last count that we did. If you look at Ratling Suspicula, the six acacia teams pool their counts and we got 69 Ratlings. In the Berkeley woodland we got five and in the Combretum woodland we got 34. To give us a to combined total of the rattlings that we counted this year of 108. And so you go on down the Grey Goway Bird and Cameron and so on. Now the, it was very early 
unclear to us that far more birds were heard than seen. I think the ratio is something like 70-30 or even 80-20. So it's very important to have in each team someone who knows the calls of every bird they're likely to encounter. Because if you don't do that, it compri compromises the, the um, count. Individual teams that are going out came back with, with uh, totals of between about, about 30 and 60 species per count. Um, Melissa, I have to say yours is usually more because you, you um, know now through like the back of your hand. But um, that's the sort of, uh, <laughs> sort of figure that comes up between 30 and 60. But if you combine the 18 counts that come in, our counts every year were between 100 and 135 species. And if you add those up over the years, and we steadily add one or two this year, we added a four colored lark for the first time. Our current total of, of woodland birds is 211. Now the data that we've collected is um, freely available on a spreadsheet that's on the Friends of Now Flag um, website. Each species, we give the counts in each woodland type for every year that we've done it. And anyone can go onto that. If your favorite birds are crimson breasted trike or maybe a rattling cystic lark, I imagine that. Um, you can go in and see how your bird has fared over the over the 20 years that we've been counting. Um, as a general finding we've had is that the acacia has the highest number of individual birds and it has the highest species of diversity, whereas Berkia is the lowest one. So you tended to find when people were allocated teams, they would say, yeah, yeah I've got acacia or oh, gee, I've got Berkia. But um, the counts have equal value. Um, 68 species have been recorded every single year. And this list on the left, these are, these are some of them. And then about another 70 are recorded in some years and not others. And then less than 50, 40 or so, have been recorded just once or twice, maybe three or four times in the 20 years. And if you exclude the quillas, and I'm going to talk about the quillas a bit just now, we count about 2,300 individual birds every census. Now, one of the issues with censusing like this is the relative detectability of birds. We've never, for example, had a, a nightjar in our accounts. Even the nightjars are fairly common in the display. Um, and you can't say from the, the, the table up here that the ratio of rattling suspicious to, uh, to Grey go away birds is 108 to 87 because grey go away birds are far more visible and noisy and detectable than, than the cysticula and they perch up high on trees. Whereas the cysticulas live in the lower canopy and in the undergrowth and you pick up most of them by hearing their calls. But if you compare apples with apples, you can say the two cysticulas, rattling and medici down here, um, are equally detectable. So that ratio of 108 to 47 is probably a measure of the relative abundance of those two species in nails flay. But our counts are not so much about comparing rattlings with grey luries as comparing rattlings, rattlings from this year to the next year to the year after that. Um, these um, three columns that you see also show us how Many species are mainly in the acacia, or mainly in the Berkia, or mainly in the Combretum. Um, rattling suspicious, as you can see, are far more common in acacia than in Berkia, and so on with the Cameroptera and Crystal, Francolin, and, and so on. And um, Berkia woodland, the uh, Forktail Dronga is dominant there, African Grey Warmbull, Southern Black Tit, and so on. And Combretum woodland is one of the spots where red crested Coran are got more, more commonly than other birds. So, there's this distinct preference of different woodlands by different species. Some species are called equally. Now it was comforting to find over the years that a large proportion of the birds we were counting have remained pretty constant over 20 years. Rattling cysticla, for example, we counted typically between 1900 birds. White bright scrub robin between 30 and 40. Aramark babblers between 60 and 70, chin spot battises between 50 and 20, and so on. Um, so that was a, 
nice finding to have. And this, looking at the Grey Goway bird again, gives you the sort of graph we got over 20 years. It's got its ups and downs, but 20 years ago we counted about 100 in a census, and now these last counts we still count about 100 in a census. And that's what I mean by their numbers have been pretty consistent over the years. Of course, there have been ups and downs. We compared this with the rainfall over the six months that preceded the, the um, counts. Um, and this histogram shows each year's six months rainfall value. And in the first 10 years of this counting were wetter than average times. You can see many of these um, histograms went over the average. And by contrast, the latter 20 years have been drier than average, getting worse these last three years. So there's been this distinct wetter and drier periods that we've been counting. And yet that's not reflected in the counts we've made of, of many of the birds. Not all of them are counted now. And then in one year, that's the year 2014, a runaway fire went through Nails Flay and it burnt out virtually the whole reserve and it killed a lot of large trees. It was quite a high impacting fire. And I'll show you one species that was affected by that. The red quila, which I mentioned earlier, is a real boom or bust bird. On the Springbok Flats nearby, there are millions, perhaps tens of millions of them that come in to feed on the uh, manna and the millet and so on that's grown there in, in many years. But on nail slay, it's mostly in very small numbers. It's sometimes not even present. So you see in these wet years, we typically got less than 200 of them counted. And then we had these three spikes, which sync with the dry years that we had. We had 6,900 counted there and 5,000 there and 12,338 counted there. I'll leave it to Farning to explain how I counted 12,338 quilias. But the figures demonstrate that um, quilias came in in these dry periods uh, rather than in the wet periods, which I might have perhaps expected. Now, as far as the fire impact goes, there was one bird that was particularly impacted, and that's the laughing dove. Um, here's the rainfall. Uh, background and here's the laughing dove numbers that we counted over the years usually between 15 and 30 birds counted it's not a, not a common bird in the woodland but in the year following the fire the fire was in october and this count was in in january they spiked to 132. so it meant a large number of laughing doves moved into the system to make use of all this bare ground that was lying everywhere another bird that showed the similar sort of trend was the golden breasted bunting I haven't shown a graph of that one. Now, I've put in a bridge at the here to show the effect of time of year. Um, in summer, we never, we, I don't think any of the teams ever saw Richard the Cuckoo, but we, we detected them by hearing their calls. And if you didn't know their call, which I don't think anyone doesn't know their call, you wouldn't detect them. But the, the counts that we did before the 5th of February, uh, we got an average of nine Richester cuckoos uh, counted from their calls. After the 5th of February, the count went down to 1.7. I'm sure the Richester cuckoos were still there, but they had largely gone silent. Now, if we'd done these counts in the middle of winter when most birds are silent, for example, the tinker birds, you'd never hear one in winter where we got quite a lot in the summer. You um, you'd miss them. So this demonstrates the importance of, of calls being the thing that make, uh, make the um, birds detectable. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about species where the graphs give a trend to show that they've been increasing. There are about 10 species that then show that are increasing and then about another 10 or so that look like they're on the decline. And these two doves, it's, it's quite a startling finding for me. I think Farley is going to comment on it a bit more. But in the early years, we counted perhaps 150 or so uh, Cape turtle doves, whereas in latter years, we're counting about 250 Cape turtle doves. And I think even though there's a lot of ups and downs, it's a very clear thing that their numbers have increased. Similarly, with the red-eyed dove, although it's a much less common bird, in the early years, we were counting about 20, and now we're counting about 50. So it's one of these species that's increased. 
Um, another increase is the crest of francolin, which is uh, commonest in the occasion. It's a pretty common bird in mouse lake. Our overall counts are about 53, so you can get an idea of its abundance from that. Um, and it's mainly an acacia bird, but if you look at the changes over the years, the increase in their numbers has not been in the cache, it's been in the Combretum. Um, so that's uh, another interesting finding. Perhaps someone in the audience can explain perhaps why a game bird like this has increased like this. Then the next one up is the woodland kingfisher. It's a conspicuous bird, it's noisy and it's very visible. So the count that we have, although it's done a pretty dramatic dip one year, has been an upward trend from about um, 30 in the early years to about 55 in the later years. So it does seem to us that this is a bird that has increased over the years. And I brought in the, the bearded woodpecker because in the early years we only counted two or three, but we got, we got them every year. But in these last few years, their numbers have gone up quite dramatically. I mean, nothing to compare with the woodland kingfisher, but looking, looking at 14, 15, 16 birds. And the suggestion that's been made um, from this is that perhaps that fire which knocked out a lot of large trees and has taken a few years for them to start to decay has been to the benefit of the bearded woodpecker. There's now a bigger food resource for them and perhaps a nest site resource for them. That's pure speculation about, it's pure speculation about all these findings but uh, it's, it's a plausible story I think. Another two birds that have increased dark cap bulbul, which is a common, very common bird across the woodlands of most of South Africa, not particularly common in Niles Bay. Our average is only 26 birds over that time, but look at how their numbers have increased from 10 or 15 in the early years to 35, 40 in the latter years. Um, Fanny's going to have something more to say about that as well. The virtual starling is a an acacia specialist. It's mainly an acacia, pretty common, 30 birds on an average, and it looks like its numbers are also on the increase in the in the acacia. And there's another acacia bird that seems to have increased over the years as well, the magpie shrike. You see, from early years of 15, 20 to latter years of 30, 35. So these are acacia species that have increased, but I'm going to show you now some of the acacia species have really declined quite dramatically. Um, the black tits, another one that looks like it's on the increase, although it's done quite dramatic yo-yos. I find this hard to believe because in the years that I've worked on the Savannah Vine project, the black tit was one of my target species. And in those times, it looked like a pretty stable, sedentary bird, territorial all the year around and so on. But these figures suggest they're on the up and up. The greyback Comoroptera also an increase, but it's largely restricted to the acacia. So it's another acacia species that's gone up. Now, starting with the species that have gone down, this is to me the, the biggest enigma, the forktail drongo. In the early years, we counted 70 or so, and now we're counting 40 or so, 40, 50. And it looks to me like it's a pretty clear bird in decline. It's common in males, maybe. Our counts are 56 overall. And it occurs in all the woodlands, but as I showed earlier, it's mainly in the Burke or more often in the Burke Now, this decline has occurred in all three woodland types equally. There's been some pretty cool studies done on drongos in the Northern Cape, how they forage with suricates and how they use the suricates as beaters and catch the grasshoppers that are flushed. Um, that the suricates put up and, and, and lots of other things about the mimicry and so on. On Nailslo they do the same thing, not with suricates, but they follow all, all mammals from warthogs to harlot and kudu to giraffe and use them as beaters and because they dynamically built with their forked tail to catch things on the wing, that's what they're designed for. Could it be perhaps that something has changed in that um, those beaters that they use? Are there less warthogs? Are there less? They're not less giraffe, but perhaps the less herbivores and other things that has been, or could it be ground cover or something? Anyway, I think there's a, a, a great topic to be had looking at what's happening to the drongos trying to explain their biology with the suspected 
Nitan and Numbers. These are two acacia birds. The crimson Mr. Truck is really one of the iconic birds of, of Nile Slave. If you go to the Jukana Hyde and park at the, at the park at the, next to the Hyde, you'll always be greeted by a crimson Mr. Truck. But our accounts suggest that they've been declining from 10, 15 in the early years to just three or four that we're getting in these recent years. Similarly, the white bird sparrow weaver has also um, done a very similar decline. Those are two species restricted to the acacia that lack um, bare open ground underneath the acacia trees. Uh, two more acacia species are also similar. Um, the Marika flycatcher has almost surely gone, um, gone down over the 20 years. Um, we used to live alongside now and slay that early period of the survey. And we had Marika flycatchers always nesting in our garden. And on the little farm we had, they were regular. And then come around about these sort of years, the pair in our garden disappeared, and we didn't see them on Ceresia either. So they, the decline that we've measured on, on male slay looks like it's been moved more widely. Just not meant to tint Pablo, um, doesn't go onto the ground, it, it forages in, in the foliage. So I'm not sure what's going on there. And then lastly, I just wanted to show the results we got on these three migrants from Europe. Um, they're all small birds, 20, 30 grams, and they all undergo this massive Crossia migration, 8,000 kilometers back to the Palearctic where they breed. And they all arrive here in late October, early November. And uh, there's been this concern in Europe about the fate of small insectivorous birds from the use of pesticides and things like that. Um, it's been expressed quite, um, quite widely over, over the years. So here are the graphs we've got for 20 years on the redback track. It's done these pretty big ups and downs, but the red line shows that in the 20 years, nothing much has changed in its number. Similarly with the spotted flycatcher, same pretty dramatic yo-yos, but the overall picture suggests um, that numbers haven't changed, although this dip that we've had in the last four years, it remains to be seen whether that continues. But then look at the willow warbler, willow warbler graph. I mean, this, this is almost certainly in decline. We, we used to get um, 30 to 40 in the early years. Now we good if we get 20 birds um, in these last years. So um, I put this up just to, to show not a suite of birds that live in a particular woodland and so on, but three small migrants that commonly come to Niles and, and what's happening to them. So in, in conclusion, and before passing over to, to Fani, you know, I'd like to say, first of all, a big thank you to all the people that have, that have participated in, over the years. I mean, we're 20 years and we have on average 60 people coming on board. And uh, these are members of the Friends of Nails Flay and the Vitz Bird Club and the two local bird clubs, the, um, the Boswell Fool Club and the Nagwam Fool Club, they, their members loyally support this. And these are the broad conclusions that, that I've sort of covered already. We get about 150 species that are resident in some in the woodland. Another 70 of them occur more sporadically. Some of these species occur in all the woodlands, but many are restricted to just one or the other. And as I said, the acacia is richest in numbers and diversity, and the book is the poorest. And then in, in most species, the numbers have remained stable over these 20 years. And what a contrast that is to the floodplain, where it's a real boom or bust. 150 to 100,000 water birds one, one year and none the next year. And this variability in the season drain fall that I've shown really doesn't explain changing numbers except in the last couple of species I've mentioned. The one I didn't mention is the barn swallow. In the rainy years, we got many more barn swallows. Otherwise, the drivers and on what's causing these increases in declines are, are all pretty speculative, and I'm sure many people in the audience might have much better ideas than we do about why this is. So that's um, my part of this talk for me, and I can hand over to you. Yeah, well, thanks a lot for that, Warwick. Um, let me just quickly share my screen.
Great, thanks. Um, before I start, I just want to say it's really for me a privilege to share a platform with, with Warwick. It's always been a, a, a basically an icon for me, both as an ornithologist and also uh, the area where I grew up in Aelstrom, of course, Molly Molly, is re really a legend of the Waterberg. So it's uh, really a great for me to, to share the platform with him. So what I'm going to look at tonight um, is one of my interests. So my interest is to see how bird communities link into ecological functions in a landscape and to habitats and so on. So what I've done for, for all the birds that's been observed uh, over the 20 years in the census is to group them into different guilds and see what we can uh, deduce from, from that if we look at the guild level. So just briefly to show you the different feeding guilds that I've um, grouped the birds into. So firstly, if you look at the bottom, there's the, the, uh, the seed eaters, the granivores. So that's all the species that focus on eating specifically grass seeds. Then you get the general herbivores. So they're more generalist herbivore feeding, uh, feeders. They feed both on grass seeds and on the seeds of trees and shrubs. Also um, leaves maybe, nectar, flowers, all of those kinds of things. Then you get the fruit eaters, the nectar feeders, the insect, insectivores, which feeds on invertebrates. Omnivores, uh, which is of course a combination of invertebrates and plant matter. Then I've created a, a group that's uh, kind of subjective to, to my own opinion, which I call the carnivorous insectivores and omnivores. So you can basically classify them as either invertebrates or omnivores, but they actually have a quite a significant proportion of their diet consists of small vertebrates as well. So I've created a separate guild for them. Then you get the, the mesocarnivores, which is all the, the small raptors, uh, small owls and so on. Uh, all the birds that feed on small vertebrates. Then of course at the top you get the apex carnivores, which feed on small to medium sized vertebrates, around one kilogram in size if you look at vertebrates. And then of course the scavengers. So if we go through all of these guilds, firstly we look at uh, the seed eaters. So um, firstly, I didn't include quilias in this graph because as you saw previously, quilias really occur sometimes in huge numbers. So their numbers on these graphs would totally swamp the other numbers. So I've just shown all the other seed eaters on this specific graph. So of course the seed eaters consist of things like widow birds and white ass and bishops, um, fire finches, wax balls, all of those types of species. So in general, over the last 20 years, that guild has remained relatively stable, maybe increased a little bit. But it's interesting to see at the beginning, there, there was quite a, a high, maybe a peak, and then it went through a low, and it's back up to a high again. You can't really tie it up to, to um, annual rainfall figures or anything. It may, it may be linked to the rainfall just um, immediately in, uh, before the census. I don't know, but these kinds of things need to be investigated. So one of the things I need to mention is everything I mentioned here is also just my speculation. Um, I think it should serve as a motivation for uh, scientists out there to go and maybe test some of these da uh, this data that we've generated over the last 20 years statistically. The second guild is herbivores, so that's more the general uh, plant feeders, uh, things like canaries and doves. So I think many people view canaries typically as grass seed eaters, but they're actually much more generalist herbivores. They feed a lot on, on uh, flower petals, and also the seeds of uh, trees and shrubs and so on. So you can clearly see the herbivore guild has really increased significantly. And it ties into what Warwick mentioned earlier, specifically the three common dove species, laughing dove, cape turtle dove, and red eye dove. Um, they have increased quite significantly, especially cape turtle dove and red eye dove. Actually, Cape turtle dove is one of the most common species, of course, in most landscapes. And in this specific guild, they form 60% of all the herbivores actually uh, observed during the, these counts. Next one is the, the fruit eaters. So in general, there's a slight upward trend, um, but there's mixed fortunes within species. So if you look at things like the go away bird, it remains relatively stable. But if you look at things like dark cat bulbul, speckled mouse bird, they've actually increased quite significantly. But if you look at the three uh, most common fruit eating barbet species, black wallet barbet, acacia pipe barbet, and yellow fronted tinker bird, they've actually decreased um, significantly. So I guess um, you, can, you can deduce that 
the more generalist feeders, even though they're still fruit eaters, the ones that's more general in their feeding habit, that's a habit habits like mouse birds and bulbuls, they generally fare better, it seems. And the ones that's more specialized in fruit eating, maybe they have decreased a little bit more. If we look at the nectar feeders, um, the only species I've included in here, of course, is the, the free species of sunbirds that we uh, have observed during these counts over the years. So the most common one is white-bellied and uh, the numbers of white-bellied has remained relatively stable. Amethyst sunbird has really increased significantly. It's increased if you look at the first decade compared to the, the second decade. In the second decade, it's basically increased by 300% compared to the start. So there's definitely something going on with amethyst sunbird. And uh, in contrast to that, Mariku sunbird has decreased by, bit, by about 30% if you compare the, the second decade to the first decade. So that's quite an interesting trend. If we look at the insectivores, so of course this is by far the biggest gill of all. Uh, more than 50% of the species that we've observed over these 20 years fall in this guild. So overall it shows uh, relatively relative stability, not a, a big change there. But if you drill down into to sub guilds, the subsections of the insectivores, is actually trends that do come out. If you look, for instance, at the arboreal insectivores, the, the ones that spend most of their time um, in the trees feeding, like the green hutupi and the long-billed crumbback, um, the, the general trend is still stable over time, but it's interesting to see the, this trend. It seems like there's a trend of an increase and then a gradual decrease over time. And the trend has repeated itself during the census. So it would be interesting to see once we continue the census over the years to come, if this trend continues, and it would be fascinating to know what this is actually linked to. Is it just, um, is it just linked to, uh, is there no reason for it or is it linked to some kind of vegetation cycles or climate cycles or rainfall cycles? It would be very interesting to, to, to learn that. Another trend that is, uh, probably quite worrying is if we look at the intra-African aerial insectivores. So these are the, typically the swallows that migrate uh, from South Africa to more northerly parts in Africa. Um, the three most common species, red breasted swallow, greater striped and lesser striped swallow, all three of them have shown really significant decreases of close to 40 to 45 percent if you compare the second decade to the first decade. So what could the, the reason for that be? Could it maybe be linked to insecticides and pesticides that spread on the type of insects that they feed on? This may be something to be looked at. Um, you know, BirdLife South Africa and BirdLife International um, wants to focus on, on monitoring some common bird species as well. And these are the types of species I think that we, we should be focused on because um, this might be indicating to us some changes in the, in the larger landscape. If these species are decreasing. It would be interesting also to see if this trend um, is reflected across the province and not only at Nails Flair. Then if we look at the omnivores, um, so that's a, a broad range of species like uh, most of your starlings, most of your weavers, your ground birds like your spurfell and Franklin and guinea fowl. They show a general increase and species like southern mask weaver for instance it's really done very well over the last 20 years it's increased by basically 160 percent over this time period so that might also be an indication of something then uh, if, if we look at the carnivorous insectivore um, guild so um, the species that make up this guild firstly is it's a very small range of species so it's like your hornbills that's um, that feeds on insects and also some of them are quite omnivorous, but they also include quite a significant portion of small vertebrates in their diet. And also things like your virtual schuylkill. So they seem to show an upward trend, but most of this trend is actually linked to one species, which is African grey hornbill, which is the most common one in this guild, which has shown an increase of about 30% over this time period. Then if we look at the, the miso carnivores, so just need to state that you can't really uh, deduce anything from this specific graph. Because um, there's, there's actually very few species in this field that's, that's being monitored. Uh, and that's been counted over the census period. 
Um, and most of this ups and, these ups and downs that you see are linked to the, the presence or absence of Amur falcon specifically. So um, the, the other most common mesocarnivore in the system is the black wing kite. And these two are by far the, the most common mesocarnivores that's, uh, that's observed. But you can't really read anything into this, these graphs. Although the Amur falcon seems to have become more prevalent over the last 10 years. And lastly, apex carnivores and scavengers. I didn't even include a graph because uh, we can't really deduce anything from, from the graph because they have been monitor, uh, observed at such low levels in Hellsfly as Warwick alluded to earlier. So they occur at very low levels and I'll speak a little bit more about it later. Moving uh, uh, away from the feeding yields, I also looked at um, habitat yields to see if um, specific birds with certain habitat requirements show specific trends. So as Warwick also alluded to earlier, there's definitely something going on with some of the acacia species. So I selected all the species which you can classify as arid savanna specialists. So most of them have their core ranges in the Kolari system and the arid cornfeld savannas of um, Limpo Western Lapopo and so on. And across the board, most of them on average, the whole group decreased by over 50% during this time period. The top three species, which is white bread sparrow weaver, crimson brisher shrike, and mariku flycatcher, has decreased by over 40%. And even other species like acacia pied barbet, which um, are more spread across the country, but are also more linked to, to arid habitats nationwide, they've also decreased. So, this might be an indication that there's some structural changes happening, especially in the acacia habitat. So these are birds that like more open areas. So to test this kind of hypothesis, I looked at species that prefer more thickly vegetated areas. And a similar trend, but just the opposite trend. Uh, so this maybe is a confirmation of the hypothesis. So Figured loving species like your white throated robin chat, orange breasted bush shrike, and great back camera has definitely increased a lot. On average, the group has increased by 30%, and white browse, a white throated robin chat has more than doubled during this period, actually. So, there seems to be um, an indication that, especially the acacia habitat, is maybe thickening, um, and there's maybe a species turnover between different habitat um, preferences. So I think this is definitely something that needs to be studied. Um, it might be linked to something totally unrelated, but it also might be linked to, to the presence or absence of certain grazers. Maybe the absence of bog grazers over a longer time period in the system has made this difference. And even also the, the change in, in fire regimes could have had an influence on this. Then, um, I looked at all the species that really has showed a big increase and what I picked up is many of them was actually common garden birds in our cities and towns here in the northern parts of South Africa. Things like your dark cat bulbul and red-eyed dove and many other species. So I looked at all the species that I, that I basically subjectively think, uh, thought about as kind of garden birds, if you can call them like that. And in general, that whole um, guild showed an increase of 20%, which is not, of course, very significant, but it is still an increase. So there might be some kind of indication that um, some of the, there's a trend where some generalists are replacing some specialists in the system. And it might not be linked specifically um, in a small scale to nail flare itself. It might be a mo much more large scale impact that's happening all across this region where the habitat is maybe becoming a bit more simplified, is maybe a bit more human impact. So species that's more adjusted to, to human habitats and so on, are maybe finding it easier to, to survive in these areas. Just an hypothesis, but it also needs to be tested. So the conclusion on all of this is Warwick also said, um, the bird community overall has remained relatively stable in Hellsflay over the last 20 years. There seems to have been some species exchanges. Uh, for instance, open acacia habitat specialists um, are being replaced by thicket loving species, and maybe um, more habitat and feeding specialists are being replaced by more generalist feeders and habitat generalists. 
But overall, the, the system still seems to remain relatively resilient from a bird community perspective. However, there's one thing we always need to be aware of, and that's the shifting baseline syndrome. And that's um, where people view the, the current status quo as, as, the, as how it should be, as what normal should be. And they kind of forget what, what happened in the past. So it, this is a common thing to happen in, in nature um, ecology, where people see the actual low levels of biodiversity now and view that as normal. While a few decades ago, biodiversity was actually at much higher levels. So over the last 20 years, that there hasn't been a, a significant change in the Hellsflase bird community, but definitely the, the decades preceding the census, there's been a, a massive change, and that has been the, the decline in apex raptors and scavengers. As Warwick mentioned earlier, before the 1950s, battalier were still very common in the system. They disappeared in the 50s, and it's probably linked to um, them taking poison baits that was set out for, for jackal control. They're very susceptible to those kind of things. And um, as you also mentioned, the, here's actually an article that Warwick wrote in the 70s showing the, the Marshall Eagle nest in Hell's Flay. And they nested until the late uh, 70s and then they disappeared and it was thought that um, they might have been shot by, by the neighbor. There's another photo that Warwick took uh, in 1978 of a Marshall Eagle nest close to Wombas, Bella Bella. So in those days, Marshall Eagle were more common in the Waterberg. And these days, they're really rarely seen. Uh, you see one or two um, more juvenile birds um, just utilizing that, that quickly and then disappearing again. Another species um, we also can talk about is Warburg's Eagle. So Warwick told me that um, in the late 70s, early 80s, he used to monitor 22 pairs of Wahlberg's eagles in the Niles Flay district. And three pairs were nesting actually in the reserve itself. And um, they gradually declined. And by the time we started with the census in 2000, there were no breeding pairs in the area left anymore. Luckily, there's now one breeding pair uh, back in Niles Flay. So hopefully they can, uh, their numbers can pick up again. Their decrease has probably been linked to the quila control, unfortunately. So. Um, as the quillas have a, a big impact on some of the farming that's being done on the Springbok Flats, um, when they ne nest in their colonies, people come and they spray the co uh, colonies with po a poison, and then the, the eels will go in and, and eat those birds and uh, die from secondary poisoning, unfortunately. So that might have um, removed some, uh, most of the Warburg's eagles from the system. So just to put it all in one big picture, um, I tried to compare Nails Flay um, with, with a relatively pristine natural area in South Africa. And of course, the, the biggest pr relatively pristine natural area you can get is the Greater Kruger ecosystem. So I took the Southern Bird Atlas Project's data on, on that ecosystem and compared it to Nails Flay. And the results are quite illuminating. So if you look at all the guilds and you compare Kruger to Nails Flay, so let me first explain what this means. So this is basically a comparison of all the guilds uh, in relation to the whole bird community. So you can see that most of the guilds are actually quite similar in their prevalence throughout both systems. The nectar feeders and uh, fruit eaters uh, are 1.5 times more prevalent in the Kruger ecosystem. But that's kind of expected because Kruger has more tropical elements. There are uh, more sunbird species, there's, there's more fruit eating species. So you would expect that. But across the board, all the other guilds are quite similar in their prevalence, except until you get right at the top, of course. You can clearly see the, on the apex carnivore side, um, if you go to Kruger, you're four times more likely to see an apex carnivore and six times more uh, likely to see a scavenger in system. So this is clearly an indication of what's happened in Hellsfly and actually the, the greater Bushveld ecosystem over the last 50 or 60 years. So I don't want to end this on a negative note, you know. Um, there's always a positive, there's, there's always hope. And the, the positive is that there's still lots of habitat left in, in the savannah bio, biome in South Africa, in Limpopo, in Northwest, Bumalanga, and those areas. The key is just that we need to change people's attitudes and people's management practices 
and um, we need to to change society basically in a way to enable us to manage our uh, properties and our lands in a more sustainable way so that these key species that fulfills these key roles in these natural ecosystems can recolonize. Just want to end off with a couple of slides. Um, firstly, I want to invite all of you to, to please join, join us in this and continuing with the census. So um, the next one will take, take place on, from the 22nd to the 24th of January. Um, if anyone wants any more info or wants to book, they can contact Marion. Um, you can get her contact details on the Friends of Nails Flay website, or just um, quickly write it down from this slide. So um, we're, we're really looking for, for expert birders that can assist us because we, we need to keep the accounts um, consistent from previous years. So the type of person we would be looking for to, to, to help us with this is typically someone with, uh, I would say, a life list between 450 and 500 minimum and a good knowledge of bushveld birds. And as Warwick also alluded to earlier, um, it's very important they know their calls very well. About between 70 and 80% of, of observations during the, these counts are done via call. So if you possess those skills, please come and join us. It's really a lot of fun every, every uh, year. And we're trying to, to bring in some, some fresh things this year. So we're gonna look at establishing a bio bash over the whole weekend. So it's not only gonna, going to be focused on birds, we're trying to bring other types of biodiversity experts in as well, so that we can do a whole bio bash. But we'll still give more details about that at a later stage. Then I also just want to market the reserve a little bit. So we all know during this COVID crisis that um, the ecotourism industry has really gone through a very bad patch financially. And Nailsflay is back open for business. At this stage, it can take uh, day visitors again, and the campsite is open. Hopefully, the other facilities uh, like these chalets that you can see in the pictures will also be open soon. I can really um, um, say to people, please come over there for a weekend. It's a, really a great place to relax. There's not a lot of tourists around. You can walk uh, through the whole reserve without anyone bothering you. It's very accessible. There's nice facilities as well kept. So please come and support our nature reserve. Then I'll just also want to end off with acknowledging the people that's been responsible all the, for, uh, over all the years for the census, Marian and the team, the Wits Bird Club for financial support as well, of course, Warwick and Michelle, all the census participants over the years, and also the Nails Flame management and staff, without which none of this would be possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much for that funny and Warwick, my word. I, uh, the nostalgia is really, really high after those fantastic presentations and I can only echo funny sentiments there. Nails Flay is a spectacular reserve and it's definitely where I cut my birding teeth back in the day. Um, and I would highly encourage all of our listeners, if you haven't had the privilege of going to Nails Flay yet, get it on your bucket list and get out there and go and enjoy that spectacular place. Well, I can finally thank you so much. Um, incredible to see the trends that have come out of those 20 years of hard slug and collecting data over the years and just amazing to see how valuable these long-term data sets really can be. And um, we've got questions flying in through the Q&A box. So before I get into those with both of you, um, we need to announce our Jakarta Media Monthly winner. And so I hope everybody had a chance to enter this month. But I'm really excited to announce that our Jakarta Media Monthly winner this year, who's going to be taking home some very exciting titles, is Jeff Thompson. So a big congratulations to you, Jeff Thompson. You will be winning a Beat About the Bush by Trevor Carnaby Comprehensive Guide, as well as Searching for Francois Levaillon by Professor Ian Glenn of UCT, the Insider's Guide to How and Where to Photograph Birds by Isaac Pretorius, as well as Rob Little's Terrestrial Game Birds and Snipes. So congratulations, Jeff, um, a really well done to you, and I hope that you enjoy those titles. We'll be getting in touch with you later this week just to uh, confirm your prize. So well done to our winners this evening, and uh, you'll see the advert for the Nails Flare Woodland Bird Census flashing on the screen as we go. 
please feel free to jot down those details and make sure that you um, join us on that weekend. Um, we're obviously looking for really talented birders to come out and join us. So if you feel like you've got the bushveld birding chops for it, we'd really love to have you along and help us contribute to this ongoing data set that has proved to be so valuable. So now that we've gotten all of the admin out of the way, Fani and Warwick, I hope you're ready for some live Q&A. We've got about 20 minutes to go until we cut off at 8.30. So I'm gonna kick us off with a question from one of our dedicated listeners and chair of BirdLife and Quasi. And that's Penny Abbott. And I think Warwick, you're probably going to be best placed to answer this one. Penny's asking whether there has been any significant vegeta vegetation changes over the 20 years that you've been doing the survey. And I think if you can also just speak to the, the changes beyond the reserve boundaries as well when you answer this question, please. Thanks, Warwick. Sure, that's uh, quite a big question. <laughs> and Nail Slay, we've, we've never monitored vegetation um, but we, were, when we had that fire go through, it was very demonstrable how things changed for a for a period, you know, with the dead trees and so on. I think overall that area, a lot of the neighbouring farms are game farms, and they tend to be, um, in my opinion, understocked. With the result that there has been a thickening, and this this may or may not apply to nails flay because nails flay is managed primarily for the roan because it's such a valuable animal. And because of that, they cut down other herbivores that might compete with the roan, like the impala or kept down to small numbers and so on. And so overall, nails flay itself, and I think this is reflected more widely, is, is underutilized by herbivores with, with the result that um, there are a lot of areas that are not grazed at all, are thick. Um, so I think there have been changes uh, a penny, yeah. Mm. Thanks so much, Warwick. Then you mentioned the the bitterns that have disappeared. I suppose following on from that, what do you think's driven this this disappearance of the bitterns from nails flow? I, I, I think it's a much wider problem than just nails flow. Um, you know, it's not the bitterns could never have been resident there. They would have had to come in from somewhere else when it flooded like that. And I think the pool of bitterns around that can make use of these ephemeral wetlands has just gone. Um, in, a, in, in the UK and places like that, the bittern, which has been very well studied, uses estuaries and things a lot in, in the winter months. They don't migrate to other climates. And you know, a lot of our estuaries, have have really been compromised and so perhaps it's an issue with estuaries but I, I don't know I'm just sucking drawers pulling straws out yeah <laughs> no certainly um all right the next one I'm gonna fire at Fani so Wenceslas is asking Fani just for a bit of clarity on your your presentation you excluded red-billed quellias from the Granivore Vill, uh, sorry, Granivore Guild. Given their large numbers, aren't they applying pressure on resource availability for the other granivores using the reserve? Yeah, I'm sure that's a very valid point. I'm sure they, they must um, exert a, a huge in influence. I mean, this year when we did the count, quellias were at their highest levels ever in the last 20 years. They started nesting in those reeds, so um, they must have a, a big impact on the other granivores uh, and maybe other guilds as well. So um, there's so many things actually that, that we can still do research on in, in, in this reserve, you know. We're just touching the tip of the iceberg here and we at this stage, uh, we don't have any clear answers to these things. It all needs to still be researched, but uh, quillas must definitely have a big impact on the overall ecosystem actually. Also in attracting raptors sometimes, you know, this year, not uh, in the morning when we did the actual census, but during the day, we saw lots of lesser spotted eagles around. I don't know if some of you also picked it up, but um, they, they might have been around there to, to pick up some of the, the quilla chicks, I don't know. So they also attract some of the, the raptors to the reserve. So they have a big influence on the overall ecosystem. Certainly, they absolutely do. We've, we've got a number of um, people asking questions around the, these insect uh, declines. And we know globally that we're going through a major I believe it's been termed the insect apocalypse. 
um, where we're seeing massive declines in, in the abundance of, of insectivores. And Warwick, I remember you showing, particularly with those paleoctic migrant graphs and that willow warbler sort of drifting off into decline, um, willow warblers being the, these gleaning insects that capture little aphids and things off of the leaves. Um, how prevalent do we know whether the, the sort of use of pesticides in the broader nail spray area is? Are we able to engage with farmers nearby to, to find out about their pesticide use? Do we know if the farmers in the broader area are using pesticides? And do you think that is potentially why we're seeing these big declines across our insectivorous guilds in the reserve? Melissa, you broke up a little bit there, so oh, I didn't sorry. get the full question. Um, maybe Fani, could you answer it? Oh. Um, Warwick, um, from my side, I don't really know um, the local farmers, what the volume of use of their insecticides would be. But I would presume there is quite a fair am amount of uh, use of insecticides uh, on the Springbok Flats nearby Nails Flay. But I think it's not only a problem in that general area, of course, it's a, it's a problem across the whole country, the whole landscape, and it's increasingly becoming a problem in the rest of Africa. So I think these, these swallows that we're seeing that's declining, it might not only be re, um, a result of uh, factors in the Niles Flay ecosystem, it might be factors all around, all along their migratory pathway as well, you know. So it, it's a large scale issue actually, globally. Absolutely. Warwick, I don't know if you'd like to add anything to that, just talking around pesticide use. Um, the, the Springbok Flats is a big and an, an important agricultural area, and those crops are grown with pesticides, you know, everything that makes crops grow. So, and the quilias are just uh, one thing where you can see the impact. I mean, they bring in um, explosives and everything every year to, to control those quillia numbers. Um, and, and the quillias do devastating stuff. And, and so the, there must be a lot of bicule in addition to just the quillias. Uh, but the quillias are, are very visible the way they control them. And um, it's not pesticides so much with the quillias, but there's pesticides used for everything they grow, the hair and cotton and, and so on. Uh, yeah, it is interesting. I know when I was doing my, my PhD study, I was looking at phenology and one of the things I was always watching out for were these sphingomorpha moth outbreaks where the caterpillars come and sort of cause these total defoliation events. And those caterpillars are such a vital food source for many of our, our cuckoos and those sorts of birds. And I just never ever got lucky enough to see one of these major caterpillar outbreaks in the, in the woodlands where I was working. And it really did sort of sit in the back of my mind wondering how have we influenced the, these caterpillar and moth populations to the point where we're not getting these major outbreaks and that key food source has now sort of been removed for these, these birds coming in and who typically take advantage of all these caterpillars emerging. Um, so definitely concerning that that was something I was sort of picking up during my, my studies and I'd encourage any avid researchers out there who might be considering a, an entomological study site. Nails Flay has got such a wonderful history of research in it and Warwick, you alluded to it with Bob Scholes and Brian Walker's book um, that research through the 1970s would make such a great comparative study nowadays. So anyone looking for, for some long-term trend work, I'd highly recommend considering Nails Flay as the place to go. There's, there's great historical work to compare to and it would be great to see Nails Flay getting returned to its, its former research glory. So definitely anybody out there involved in academics, please consider looking at Nails Flay. Now, uh, Warwick, I suppose you can answer this one from Grant. He's asking, what's the best time of year to visit Nails Flay for birding? It's good to visit Nails Flay any time of the year, but of course the best months are, are from November. And if November, December, January are very good months, but if there's a flood, the, the flood usually only arrives in late January. And so for, if you know that there's a, a flood event there from January through to May, June is the best time for the flood. Absolutely, those flood years are remarkable and uh, definitely bring in some, some incredible sort of migrant and nomadic water birds that turn up when the, when the floods do happen. And um, Michael asked a question to that effect. So I think you, you've definitely answered that for him. 
And uh, I think the last really big flood was back in about 2013. There hasn't really been a major one again since, or has there been, where I can find you, feel free to correct me there. No, there, hasn't been a, there hasn't been a big flood since then. Mm. Yeah, hopefully we're due for one with this very cold winter we've been having. I'm keeping my fingers crossed. <laughs> I will certainly be up there in a heartbeat. And uh, <laughs> Eleanor Mary Cattle's asking, um, how far is Nails Flay from Johannesburg? It's a mere two and a bit hours drive to get up there. Uh, depending on your Friday afternoon traffic, it can take a little bit longer. But a uh, quick hop from Johannesburg, a nice, easy, long weekend destination, I'd say. And I'm sure Fani and Warwick will agree with me on that one. And uh, let's have a look here. Um, Kaz is asking, would fitting nonlinear trend lines explain some of the data better? So Fani, being the, the data analyst here, I'm gonna fire this one at you with some uh, statistical prowess. So um, Kaz really wants to know, we've done a lot of these sort of over, over time doing those straight line graphs like we saw that Warwick and you showed. Would it be better to start digging into some of the more creative non-linear stats that are on hand at the moment? Absolutely. Um, now I'm a chartered accountant. I'm not really a statistician. So I think people like you, Melissa, are more equipped to do those <laughs> kind of things. <laughs> Uh, certainly, and uh, I think one of the one of the amazing things every time I get to to see this data with you guys is the tools that are available to us nowadays. Um, the likes of my my colleagues Robin Kalane, who get to play with the satellite imagery and some of the more sort of landscape level analyses that we can run nowadays with the data that are available to us. I just this is begging someone to get hold of this data and do some fun uh, satellite imagery analyses to look at those bigger drivers that you keep alluding to, work and really seeing those kind of fine scale links between changes over time and rainfall, temperature, albedo, all sorts of interesting things that could be driving what birds are where. And uh, see, you mentioning that fire, I, I remember just how much that fire changed the landscape and how all of a sudden we were seeing all sorts of birds rocking up that I hadn't seen at Nails Clay before. I remember fondly sitting in what was left of one of the hides, a very charred structure at the time. Um, and a saddleboard stalk had suddenly rocked up in this completely charred and barren floodplain where a small pool of water held a few fish after that insane blaze. And uh, so watching the secretary birds move through this opened up landscape was incredible. Um, and as you said, some really devastating effects of big um, marilla trees and all sorts of things coming down. So that fire really was a game changer. Um, Tanya Anderson's asking about alien plants on the reserve. Um, Warwick and Fani, in your experience, have you seen many alien plants along, along sections of the reserve or is it still in relatively good, a good condition? Um, in my opinion, it's in pretty good condition. Um, in the early years, there was quite a lot of cactus and, and, and some lantana, and I think Friends of Nailsley played a big role in getting rid of that. I mean, you don't see a cactus now, or, or lantana. Um, on the floodplain, alien vegetation continually comes in, but um, it's, it's not uh, significant, I don't think. Yeah, in my opinion, I've also not really picked it up in a reserve, but, you know, next to the road verges, um, areas close to the reserve, for instance, the road next to the railway line, there's lots of queen of the night that still stands there, so there's potential that, that can spread over again. I've even seen pom-pom there next to that road, so um, at least it, I haven't seen it in a reserve yet. So I presume the reserve management has kept those things out. Yeah, definitely. And, and sort of credit must go to Friends of Nails Flare and Limpopo Parks for their work on keeping those aliens out. I'd agree with that statement that Nails Flare is still in really good nick. Uh, Gisela Ortner, one of our long-term listeners and great supporters of bird life, is asking, where do all the birds go in the dry season? Or if, would you like to, uh, to add a bit <laughs> on to that? Is it the birds going or the birds that are not present? <laughs> Well, unlike the flamingos, we don't have many, any of them with, uh, with trackers on them. But a lot of the, the uh, water birds that come in are tropical species like the, the Lesser Moorhen and the Allen's Gallinule and, and some of the crakes, the striped crake and um, uh, well, the, probably half a dozen dwarf bitten's a big one. And I think those birds move south from wherever they have spent their other time, probably across, across the equator. And they move south 
And if they sense if there's rain south of Zambia, they move further south. And if they're in Zimbabwe and they sense if there's rain in South Africa, they they move into South Africa into these wetlands. And when when uh, when we lived there, you know, we one day there would be no water, and uh, a week later there'd be water, and there'd be birds already walking around, and the first dwarf bitterns would have arrived. Um, so a big pool of the birds come from the tropics. But the local birds, um, I don't know how they sense that they, there's water there, but they certainly do. Um, we, we, we lived very close to the floodplain, and at night we would hear coots flying over, going hoo, hoo, like this in the dark. So a lot of the movement happens at night. So when you go to the floodplain in the morning, wow, there are birds there. Um, but how they know <laughs> there's water there, I, I don't know. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that is one of the, the modern tracking studies that needs to happen is how on earth these water birds find those flood systems. And they really do almost appear out of nowhere uh, like magic, but it is quite a, a spectacle to behold. Now, uh, Warwick, we're going to delve into a bit of taxonomy here and, and feel free to bat this question away. But Raoul's asking the little bitterns that are um, recorded on nails flay. Do you know if these are the subspecies Minutus or if they are Paisi or both? Um, and do you know if, if the subspecies are both breeding there? The, the little bitterns breed in numbers on, on the floodplain when it floods. And so I think we probably only get the, the resident, the African one. Um, they arrive just like the dwarf bitterns and set up shop and the males all start calling everywhere and um, breed in singly or little colonies. So they, they, they breed in numbers and um, definitely the African ones. Absolutely. And uh, we got a question here or sort of a comment from Alan White saying, we're obviously doing these transects from kind of six in the morning till eight in the morning. And that'll definitely not take into account your nocturnal birds, as you mentioned with the night jars. Um, but he's saying owls and owlets are probably a bit overlooked. Is there, there any indication of what's happening with their populations? I suppose the pearl spotted owlet would be the only one that we may catch a glimpse of during our surveys. Um, Warwick, would you like to comment a bit on that? And then finally, you can add yeah. in some well, we, from We're that. looking for volunteers to do night surveys. I mean, we haven't started yet, but maybe this year. There we go. We need <laughs> 60 people. No, we, we, we have no handle on that. Um, we, we we sometimes have got a Vera's eagle owl in the census. I don't think we've ever had a spotted eagle owl. And of course, we've never had night jars. Um, but I think I can't comment on whether they're going up or down. Night jars are still pretty common in the house, but not you hear two species calling through the sun. Right now. Absolutely. Fanny, would you like to add anything to that? No, I can't really add anything, Melissa. As you mentioned earlier, the, the only one we really pick up relatively um, often during the census is the pearl spotted out early in the morning. The rest we can't really comment on. Yeah, absolutely. I suppose the only ones that we regularly get to see are those barn owls that sometimes live in the roof of the house. <laughs> but uh, yeah, always, always special to run into those nocturnal birds. And I, I like your suggestion, Warwick. I think we have to employ some torches and headlights and some rather keen people to join me out there in the night. <laughs> but uh, we've got a question here from Cameron asking, would it be possible to reintroduce um, apex predators and scavengers into nails flare? And I suppose the challenge here really comes from these landscape level challenges that we're facing as a conservation community. And uh, as you've shown, an area the size of Kruger is able to support these healthy populations of these apex predators and scavengers. But nails flare is, is just a drop in the ocean of a much bigger system. And uh, I suppose the, the Waterberg itself would probably be a pretty safe space. And we're working on hopefully making that a vulture safe zone, which will help a lot of our large apex predators that might then spill over onto nails flay. But it's it's really as a conservation community trying to tackle these large scale challenges that we face and threats, innumerable threats that these large birds are having to face and deal with in trying to survive and eke out a living as we change the face of the, the planet. So um, Warwick, I don't know if you'd like to, to add anything to that, but it's definitely going to be a challenge to try and reintroduce any of these large raptors. Yeah. No, I think you've said it all. Kruger Park has, has 
one owner and they manage it that way. An equivalent area outside of Kruger Park will have a thousand landowners and each one has got a different attitude to wildlife. Some love it and some hate it. And, uh, you know, it goes right through the predator spectrum from leopards down to small raptors. Yeah, Melissa, I can maybe just also comment on that. So economic drivers is a big thing that we also need to look at, you know. So it doesn't always just come down to um, the intrinsic values of the landowners. Um, sometimes economic drivers just drives landowners to, to act in a certain way. Um, if you look at game farming, it's been a huge success in South Africa over the last decades, but economic drivers has meant that intensive game farming has become more prevalent than extensive game farming. And it has more challenges normally for, for biodiversity as all intensive farming than extensive farming. So it's a very complex issue that needs to be addressed if we are to create these uh, large landscapes that's friendly to these raptors that need, the, need these huge territories to function in. Absolutely, and uh, I think on that really important point, we, we've hit our 8.30 mark. So I'm, I'm sorry to everyone who's sent in questions that we haven't managed to get to tonight, but uh, Really, really good points and really good discussions here tonight on the webinar. And I just need to extend my sincere thanks to both of you. Warwick, as I said, you, you've been a personal idol of mine for many, many years. And I actually dug up my very first Cecil Bird book this week and had a look. And it was great to, to see that that was such a landmark document that you contributed to. So thank you for everything you've done to the, assist birders in South Africa over the years and the ornithological community as well. And BirdLife South Africa as an organization, you really have been an amazing supporter of our organization. And we're very grateful to have you as a friend of BirdLife South Africa. And finally as well, I think we're so lucky at BirdLife to have an accounts manager who is such a passionate and keen conservationist at heart. Um, you keep our organization's wheels turning, but you also come up with so many exciting ideas on how we try and fix this this planet of ours and keep our birds and landscape safe. So from me to both of you, thank you so much. This was a wonderful walk down memory lane for me and I'm sure everyone's really enjoyed this evening's talk. So I'm gonna throw on some music and just leave the webinar open for people to put their comments in and just share their thanks as well. And I'm gonna say goodnight to everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Keep your eyes on the skies and keep enjoying those birds. And I will see you all again, same time, same place next week for a fascinating talk on the Titer Falcon. Be sure to tune in with our bird life species guardians for that one. It's definitely not one to miss. Thank you so much, Warwick and Fani. Enjoy your evenings. Stay safe, everybody, and we'll speak to you soon. Good night, Thanks. everyone. Yeah. Good night.